It is perhaps one of the toughest jobs in the world, being Afghanistan's president. And for Ashraf Ghani, things are not getting any easier. More than 11,000 people were killed in the country in the past year. And the UN has said if Afghanistan survives 2016, it will be considered a success. With the economy virtually non-existent, a lack of jobs and very little hope for the future, it's no wonder that there is a mass exodus, with Afghans now making up the second largest group attempting the dangerous journey into Europe. Afghanistan's president is between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, he has tens of thousands of people fleeing the insecurity in this country. And on the other, he faces pressure from the EU, which is demanding that all these Afghan migrants be returned. I'm Yalda Hakim, and I've come to Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, to discuss the many challenges this country faces with President Ghani. Mr. President, you've been in power for 543 days now. How do you think you're going? In terms of direction, we're going well. In terms of accomplishments, we have some significant ones. But in terms of satisfying the needs and aspirations of the people, we have a lot to do. Indeed, because we're looking at an exodus of people now leaving this country. Well, you know, there are pull factors on, on that and push factors. Pull factors are that this is one of the most connected societies on earth. Because we became a country of refugees. Again, in Europe, in the United States, in North America, Australia, we have at least a million people who've settled. They have a million ties that bind them with others. So they pull. They've done extraordinarily well. We're very proud of uh, our Afghans, who now are hyphenated Afghans. But that provides an aspiration, uh, particularly the social model in Europe the social welfare model, the welfare state, is done well by Afghans. In Germany, for instance, they've done extraordinary things compared to uh, uh, the United States, because the attraction uh, for an Afghan in the United States was, was 18, to earn quick money prevailed over the medium term. My cousins who went to Germany are all top scientists, doctors, etc. My cousins in the United States, some lost their way. The push factors are a war has been imposed on us. The departure of not just international troops, but their contractors took away a million upper middle class people with, in, uh, with demand from the economy. So an artificial economy that was kept going by injection of these resources faced a severe depression, a severe recession bordering on a depression. And we are in a region where rules of the game have still not been formulated. So in this context, they're both, you know, the poverty that we inherited, 41% of the Afghan population in 2014, the 2015 data is not out, was living below a dollar twenty-five. This combination is a boo, because uh, people's movement in our globalized world is restricted. Capital's movement is free, and the movement of ideas is unrestrained. In this kind of combination, thinking about boundaries and national responsibility and regional responsibility, international responsibility, are ideas that need to be retaught, organizations that need to be revitalized, and then particularly as inheritors of Islamic civilization and culture, we have a responsibility to speak and their minority is taken over, an extremely small, tiny minority is subverted the image of a great civilization, a great culture, and the lack of understanding of what Islam stands for is an aberration. And, uh, so the complexity here is probably one of the greatest. And there's no doubt that there's, uh, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, but, you know, if Afghanistan survives 2016, the UN says it will consider it a success. Is this a fair assessment? 
we will succeed. We succeeded survive. in two. We will survive, and not only will we survive, we survived in 2015. 2015 was a test of survival. But is survival now what Afghanistan is measured no, against? No, no. I mean, it's measured vis-a-vis -vis Syria, vis-a-vis -vis Yemen, vis-a-vis -vis the bar. Unfortunately, has been lowered. But that's not the bar by which our people measure ourselves. The bar is not what our international colleagues put. The bar is what the Afghan people put. And that's... Pretty the, low. It's not low, on the contrary. Then why is there a mass exodus in this country? The exodus is because I explained to you, we are a network society, we were refugees. This is not the first time these people are moving. But they feel like the security situation in this country... Feel, but no, but the, the other part is the post -exodus. With due respect, not to be uh, repetitive, there is a very strong pull factor. The pull factor of families, ties, social welfare measures. But in the last year, 180,000 Afghans have left this country. Yes. But how many Germans left? Germany in 1870s. How many Irish left after the potato famine? How many uh, Britishers, Englishmen and women left? Migration is constant. But this is a country three. where for 15 years a lot of blood and treasure has gone in to create a stable society. Sure, but it's also created one of the most corrupt sets of institutional arrangements where a tiny elite was privileged at the expense. The inheritance of that is 41% of people living below poverty. Which is something the Afghans are very frustrated about. Precisely. This is why they elected me and this is why I need to deliver. That's why I'm saying the bar by which the Afghan people judge their government is a much higher bar, and that's what we need to work on to deliver. Is this a country at war? Yes, it's a country that has become the platform for a regional and global war. We are at war, but not, we, we are not at civil war. The war among, between Afghans is a very component, small component of a regional and global war. Al-Qaeda, unfortunately, has gone deep and dark, but it's fully alive. While Daesh captures the news, we need to focus on Al-Qaeda. Otherwise, God forbid, we would have another surprise. Daesh is active here and has done atrocious things. And when I warned about the fear of Daesh, when I was inaugurated, it was ridiculed. You said that this country would become a graveyard for Daesh. That we will, but also I want in this uh, October of, of 2014 that Daesh's threat was real, we should not ignore it. We will put Daesh, and we are successfully. Were and you ignored at the time? It takes time. Uh, you know, the Cassandra syndrome, <laughs> It's a very real word. Uh, and, but we, we're making progress. Regional terrorist networks, Eastern Turkestan, the Chinese, Chechens from Uzbekistan. Which country in the region? I mean, there are very few countries in the region, Iranians or, you know, uh, uh, and Turkmen's or another, that don't export us their discontented ones. And particularly, from the, the Middle East. Now we also have the greatest medium-term threat. Massive numbers of Pakistani Taliban are being transposed into our country. This is a very significant one. And then the most significant issue, state-to-state -state relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Do you feel let down by the international community, sir? No, no, on the contrary. I mean, billions of dollars have been poured into this country, but you've also agreed this is a country at war. So why then are Europeans sending Afghans back, saying that they're economic migrants, that they're only returning because they've only come to Europe because of poverty, not war? Europe is closing in. And it's singling out Afghans? No, it's singling out Syrians and, and others. But the social contract in Europe vis-a-vis refugees was articulated and turned into a law in a period of liberalism's heyday in the welfare strength. 
that model is unfortunately being renegotiated. A lot of people, a lot of critics are saying that you are encouraging uh, this economic migrants uh, line, that people are fleeing here because of poverty as opposed to just war. I'm not. It's a court of law matter in Europe. A court in Europe decides what is the justification. There's a legal system. This is not an abstraction. I'm fully asking for full adherence to European laws, to European conventions, to conventions that Europe not only is committed itself to, but articulated. But simultaneously, there are economic migrants. There are. Uh, but there are also people fleeing persecution. I mean, 11,000 people were killed person? in this country in the last year. Persecution? Well, we need to understand. Did you ask the people of UK when Hitler was at his height in, in uh, 1941 to uh, abandon? Please understand, we have to make a commitment. 549 young men and women graduated from the military academy, 13 of them women. They are making a commitment to defend this country. Others on whom we have spent tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars want to leave and under the slightest pressure. You need to, to have will. If you want to have a country, you need to have the will. It's not the slightest pressure, though. I mean, the last what, year what, has seen the pressure? worst yeah, uh, so form of, of violence. But, but is, it, is it better elsewhere? Well, they seem, we to, have to, seem to think so. No, please, and they're not, making that very dangerous not. journey. The journey is made voluntarily. They're paying $10,000, $30,000. They are impoverishing their families in order to make that journey, because that journey was based on false assumptions. My responsibility as the elected people of this country is to make sure to defend and to ensure the conditions uh, for even-handed opportunity for people who make a commitment to stay. Those are Afghans, but they have made a choice to leave. When they leave, they break the social contract. This needs to be understood. Are you facing pressure from the Europeans? I mean, uh, there are leaked reports that show the EU is threatening to reduce aid to this country. They have not threatened to, to reduce aid. These are rumours. There's been no suggestion of reduction of aid. We have an extremely good dialogue with Europe. They've described your government as difficult to deal with when it comes to this matter. Rumours and innuendos are one thing. Not a single head of state. I have excellent relationship with all European leaders. It's called me difficult or pressured me or threatened me with cut off of aid. These courts of law that you're talking about uh, are, are talking about designated safe areas. I mean, where are these designated safe areas? I've been to the emergency hospital here in Kabul. In the last year, they say they've admitted 3,000 people just of to that course. hospital. But people being look, killed left, right and centre. Again, if you want to repeat, you're totally entitled to. Uh, but let me make the main point to you. We are under attack. Do we stand up? for our right to breathe, for our right to live, or do we pack up and go? This is an existential choice. Countries do not survive by their best attempting to flee. So I have no sympathy. My goal is to make sure that my people live with dignity, with hope, and with determination. If we don't stand up in the face of the threat and the, and the threats, the threats are very real. My life is threatened every day. You know, I go to, to different parts of Afghanistan. But you have the protection that other Afghans rockets, don't. You, you think rockets are, uh, uh, when rockets are fired, that you have protection against it? When bombs are thrown at you, you have protection against it? If I had that sense, I would surround myself in the palace and never step out. But I go constantly. None of my movements is without risk. All of us are at risk. That is the, the point. There is no security. There's either security for all of us or there's security for none of us. And it is an existential choice. It's a moral choice. I do not blame people. 
then how can you not have a sense of, um, you know, that the international community has failed you? Because the international communities are my partners. And yet this country is in the state that it's in. History is the job of historians. My job is to mend and to enforce and strengthen and deepen our relationship with the world because we need each other. That is the act of statesmanship. That is the courage that is required to forge a pathway out of this difficult situation and to come out. Not to think, what would a blame game bring us? If we blame the world, what are we entitled? There are multiple places that are calling on the attention of the world. And we need to address our own problem. Do you think you've, your country has been forgotten? No. No, on the contrary. Look, last year the commitment of the world to us was for nine months. President Obama made one of the most courageous decisions a, a global leader can take by going, revising his commitment to his nation and made a new commitment. The Resolute Support Mission was supposed to be for one year. We are now talking about a medium term horizon. We are not forgotten. What we can do is to make the world forget us. If we do not take responsibility for our own actions, the world cannot bring reform to this country, only we can. The world cannot eradicate poverty, only we can. How are the you going to create jobs in this country? By our greatest problem was our inability to spend money. We have. Last year, I didn't have any resources, but I carried reviews of all the projects, all the portfolios. I've released a lot of money that was tight, that was not moving forward. This year, we are focusing on livelihood of people. We are focusing for the first time. I've spent more sessions on water or on wheat uh, or women's productivity than it taken place in 15 years combined. People's livelihood is at the forefront of it. And this, our tragedy, is that we're an extraordinarily rich country inhabited by massively poor people. You talked about all the threats that this country faces. You've often talked about the so-called Islamic State having a presence here. Just tell me a little bit more about that. Well, Daesh uh, is a threat because in their eschatology, the end of the world, they face an army that starts from Afghanistan. But the other is, they have four phases. Organize, orient, decide, and act. And when last year I carried the analysis, it was before they were ready for decision and action. We confronted them. But the extended war that was imposed on us made us focus on other threats. And that gave them the opportunity. They have done some atrocious things, particularly in Niger. And that has enabled us to have a full popular mobilization. Would you say you've defeated Daesh in Afghanistan? No. no. But we've wounded them very deeply. And Nengrahar will be their graveyard. We are very close to finishing them off there. But these are networks. Networks are, are not defeated with a single decisive battle. How is it that the Taliban are stronger than ever today in Afghanistan? Well, because their regional support network is intact. So is Pakistan playing a double game? It's a judgment for others to make. All I'm saying is that the But as the head of state of this country, do you think they're playing a double game? We are engaging Pakistan. We've defined the problem. I've said that from the time of my visit last year to, to Pakistan, that it's an undeclared war between us. It's an undeclared state of hostility between us. And we need to end it. We've made significant progress on paper, on paper through the quadrilateral process. Now we need to see whether there is going to be adherence to those commitments or whether what you call a double game is being played. Because the Taliban have gained so much ground, why should they bother coming to the negotiating table? Because they have suffered such heavy losses, nobody's 
Yeah, they're quite powerful today in Afghanistan. No question, but so so are we. I mean, there was a massive no, embarrassment yes. for the but Afghan military. Do, 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 is, is Belgium, is Madam, Miss Aki. Remember Belgium. Remember France. Remember London. Remember 9-11. Understand, please do not jump without significant examination. Every place they've made gains, we've reversed the games. Helmand? This and Helmand included. Where, which, which capital? Uh, are they in the capital of Helmand? Well, there are concerns that it could collapse to the Taliban. Concerns are one thing. I'm talking facts, you're talking fiction. You're talking, you're reflecting with all due respect, the comments of people who are sitting on desks. Of the military? There, were, there was a, a cry for help from, from one well, of the... We, we faced an intense war. When I began as president, not a person trusted that the Afghan army would be standing today and not losing half of Afghanistan. The strategic goal of the enemy was to divide the political geography of Afghanistan. Judges by that measure, we have denied them. There are no two political geographies. Yes, we are in battle, but we've learned and we are ready to defend this country. What is your hope for your country's future? It has to become the hub of connectivity again in Asia. It is an Asia roundabout. For millennia, we were a connection. We are a center of connectivity. We are a center where East meets, East and West, North and South met, and where our people can thrive. We are an entrepreneurial people. We are a resilient people. We want to be able to direct this tremendous energy that our women, our youth, our children, and, and our elders, our artists, our musicians, our poets have to, to celebrate life, to celebrate opportunities, and to celebrate connectivity. And people shouldn't leave. They should stay in this country, rebuild the country. Absolutely, because it's as refugees, there will be always second class. And it's a choice. Do we make a country where we are all first class citizens? Or do we de leave? You, know, I, you can't blame people, but the choice is consequences. President Khani, thank you so much for your of time. Course. Thank you. Of I appreciate course. it so much. Thank you.